Well, I have had a magical, magical week um, in a lot of silence, actually. So I was at the new Kamadoli Hermitage in Big Sur, and uh, yeah, right? <laughs> so I've spent a week with monks and a hawk and uh, looking into Nirvana at Pfeiffer Beach. Pfeiffer, yeah, Pfeiffer Beach. And then last night, to top it all off, we watched the sandhill cranes that are migrating about an hour from here in this blazing orange sunset as they were settling in for the night. Yeah. So it's those magical times, you know, that we take time apart, that we refill and touch the silence again, befriend the silence, that we become again, not only come into the presence of peace, but can become the presence of peace. It's times that we take any day and any moment, right? When we drop into our hearts and we see something beautiful around us or we see it reflected in someone else. So a big part of the, the process, it seems, of peace is just sort of letting go of all the tension of life, you know? There's a Chinese proverb that says, tension is being who you think you should be. <laughs> Relaxation is being who you are. <laughs> It's really just simple and true wisdom, isn't it? Relaxation is just kind of letting go of the tension of the world that says, I've got to do this and I've got to do that and I have these responsibilities and these expectations and I expect these things of myself and you expect these things of me and society expects these things of me. Whew. And then we just need a breath, right? And that's what befriending the silence gives us is that refresh breath of spirit. When we befriend the silence, I, have, I know some people who are afraid to go into silence because they say when they do, things happen like they, they start to cry. <laughs> we act like that is such a horrible thing, right? <laughs> that we might let go of something. And guess what? When we let go, when we cry, when we open up, there's room for more. <laughs> And so that process is actually a beautiful way for us to come into the peace that the silence offers us. So many ways to experience the silence. You know, I was, um, it's been a series of, you know, how this happens when we start to open ourselves and to slow down, how serendipity occurs, you know, synchronicities abound, so-called coincidences. You know, all of that is happening all the time, and it makes me really sad to think about how much I miss when I'm in the busy mode, you know. And so if we can just catch ourselves in those busy modes and in that moment drop into the place where we are in the company of monks and hawks and viewing nirvana. <laughs> because we can do that at any time, right? It's a little easier when we spend a little time apart. Even Jesus did that, you know, the throngs of people about him wanting something and he would take a boat to another island <laughs> just to have some peace and some prayer time and some time apart. Because, you know, when we do that, we're better when we get back. And so it's those, just finding the ways that we can weave the silence, to, to make friends with it and then weave it into our lives so that it can breathe into our lives. And there's that expansive way of being, that relaxed way of being that the proverb talks about, rather than the constricted, tense way of being. So... Part of what happens in the silence, I think, and part of what the, the gifts of the silence is there's different directions it can go. So in, a, in that series of synchronicities, about a week before I left, I had bought a book here about a year ago. It was on sale in the bookstore for two bucks, I think. And I just I'd kind of forgotten about it. It was, I have like a double thing of shell, you know how sometimes you have so many books, there's like a double <laughs> layer. And so it was in the back layer. <laughs> And somehow I just felt really guided to pull that out and begin to read a book of silence by Sarah, Sarah Matlin. It's a beautiful book. And it was this really great synchronicity because here I am in the hermitage where you have your own individual, in the Kamadoli tradition, there's a walled garden outside of your own space. So you have your own very quiet space. And then looking out at, luckily in Big Sur, they didn't do four walls, they did three, so you look out at the vast ocean. <laughs> and, and so I was reading the Book of Silence, and I couldn't believe I came across 
she was talking about Camadoli, Italy, where the headquarters, the, the main hermitages of this, and there's only like a handful of, of these Camadoli monks around the world of, of these hermitages. So it was one of those synchronicities, you know. So the synchronicities abound when we get still because we begin to move into a, a place that is the witness seat. Instead of being hooked into the drama of life, being identified with the thoughts and the feelings and the beliefs and the lack and the limitation and the fear and all that stuff that spins through our lives and our minds and our days, instead of getting hooked into all that, we step back a little bit, really into the seat of the divine witness. And there we can let thoughts and feelings have safe passageway through our minds and our hearts because we're not hooked in, you know? And so even just a little time of that frees us in amazing ways and brings us to that base of peace that's always there. The peace that knows that there is peace in our minds and peace in our hearts and peace in our relationships and, yes, even peace in our world. It isn't so much that you know, peace is the opposite of war, but peace is everywhere present, you know, because God is everywhere present. So even in places of conflict and war, there is peace. Even in the midst of an argument with your spouse, you can pull at that thread of peace and bring it forth from within you and bring it through your heart, through your words, and presence it into a room and shift everything. But we, in order to do that, we need a little bit of practice at peace, right? And the practice comes in the silence. The practice comes in the quiet. The practice comes in the times when we can just, ha, huh, you know, just to be in a space where there was no, I couldn't hear a hum of traffic. I couldn't hear a hum of leaf blowers or computers or the ding of the texts coming in or, you know, any of that. It was just like, oh, wow. And then another one of those, and another one of those. And so to give ourselves those gifts in whatever ways that we find for ourselves that really nurture our own souls and our own hearts and our own beings, to give ourselves of that spiritual food is like just taking a little piece of peace and swallowing it whole. So the monks there invite us to come and witness them doing what they do best, most naturally what they do in their relaxed state of being who they are. And so every night there's vespers, and you can come and you can sing along, and a kind monk comes up and shows you where in the book to follow. Or you can just be and listen to the beauty of their chanting and their singing. And so it's such a beautiful gift because it's, it's their hermitage and it's their place of, of stillness, and it's their invitation to others to witness them in that beautiful rhythm of peace. And so to when we witness somebody who's in the divine flow, you know, who's really doing what they love and therefore doing what they do naturally and doing what they do with ease, then there is that sense of inspiration. There's, and there's that sense of being in that presence of peace, of touching that base, that foundation of peace that's there for us, sort of awakening that up. And then beginning to feel that through our whole body, you know, our shoulders begin to drop. We begin to kind of take that open stance in life. No more need for tension. And the more we visit this place in our daily lives, the more we, we kind of take that kind of expansive space, that kind of ten tension-free kind of way of moving and being in our lives. The monks then, after the singing, they invite you to join them in the Eucharist, their communion service, and then, and then in some meditation, about a half hour of meditation in this big, beautiful, open room with just a candlelight. So that kind of invitation that we make kind of naturally, sometimes deliberately, but kind of naturally, by doing what it is that we do best. How simple, really. Right? The, the key to peace could just be doing what you love to do. But actually it is because when we are in that, you know how it is. Like we think, we think a lot about or the things we struggle with or the things we don't do as well or the things that we're try, trying to do, striving to do. So we don't even think about the things we do well. You know, if you're a great cook or you're a great musician, you, know, you don't really, you don't think about that. The rest of us are watching in awe 
or enjoying in awe, listening or eating of your great food or the things that you've gardened or whatever it is that you do with ease. And when we get to witness that and, and, and really imbibe that, literally take in, consume of that, we consume the gift of divine flow, which is peace and action, essentially. So while I was sitting in my little walled, three-walled garden, looking out at the ocean on the last day, because it had rained most of the time, so t- things had opened up and the sky was clearing. So you know how it is after the rains when things clear. You know, just that feel, we all know, because we've just experienced it, right? That wonderful clearing, how clear Mount Diablo is after the rains. It's beautiful, right here for us. That's all you need for peace. Walk out here before you leave and take a look at Mount Diablo and just take a breath. (laughs) So I was sitting there and a fat hawk came along (laughs) and rested on a, a wire, you know, a telephone wire between two trees. And I could tell you in story or I could tell you in poem because I wrote a poem about it, but I think the poem sort of tells the story, so I'll, I'll, I'll do it that way. I'm praying when Fat Hawk lands on high wire between trees, bottle brush red and pine. She calls, backdropped by vast ocean, gray sky pocketed with turquoise portals opening wider to her voice, insistent. With every call, her tail flares back and her feet adjust on the wire. She calls to trees, to ground, to ocean, then turns to me, then back again. Over and over, she repeats her routine. I speak a prayer for her out loud in a whisper, affirming comfort and safety and ease, even food, though with puffed belly, it seems, breakfast was served. She looks again, her aura a bright white light. Then the trees framing her a light too. I don't know the meaning of the hawk's call. Is her fatness fullness, not from food, but unborn life? Does she she search for nesting supplies on the rain-soaked land, finding nothing suitable, soft, or dry? I don't know. I just wish her well. She looks again. We see each other. I wave. She flies. <laughs> Minutes pass. Fat Hawk returns. With mate behind. He flies toward blue waters for the hunt. She perches high on tree's peak, calls softly now, looks at me and I at her, resting together in answered prayer. Now, I don't know, really, was she pregnant? Was she full? Was he her mate? Was he going hunting? This is what the human mind does, right? (laughs) This is one of the things, one of the ways Sarah Matlin in her book of silence talks about two kinds of silence. One of them is this kind, which those of us in the West are probably more comfortable with, and it's the kind that comes out of solitude. It's like the creativity that springs forth out of solitude, the interpretations that we make in dance and music and poetry and whatever it is, painting, whatever it is that we create. And so that kind of solitude, that kind of silence has kind of a purpose to it. It's like, I'm going to take time apart for inspiration. I'm going to take time apart, yes, to remember who I am, which is at the base the same as the other kind of silence, but then to come forth into the world, back into action, carrying that peace, being that peace, expressing that peace in our, in, through our creativity or our service. Then the other kind of silence is a self-emptying silence. So this, the first kind of like a self-filling silence, right? A, a kind of a fortification of what it is, what our gifts are, how it is we serve in the world. So it's the pause that brings us back to that. And the other kind is that kind of the mystics and the monks and the sages and the desert mothers and fathers, and it's self-emptying. It's so we keep emptying until we become nobody again. And so are we nobody, or are we everybody, or are we somebody? It's all true, right? And they're all gifts that spring from the peace and the silence. 
maybe to know the different ways or the intentions that we're bringing to our silent times might be helpful sometimes. Or maybe it's just about being in it and letting whatever comes forth come forth from it. As I was leaving, I stopped at Pfeiffer Beach in Big Sur. If anybody's not been there, it truly is heaven, nirvana, another realm, at least in my eyes. I have a few pictures to share with you of that. Because it was there that there was also this sense of witnessing, a different kind of witnessing now. There were tripods and cameras being taken down to that first clear day after three days of rain on Big Sur. But here at Pfeiffer Beach, there's these mountainous rock formations. And, and there were great tide pools um, from after the storm. So what was interesting, this is one of the first things I saw. <laughs> I know, right? It's so otherworldly. And so it's, we're all drawn to that place where there's holes through the rocks. Every, all the tourists, all of us were there, you know, with our phones up taking videos as the water was moving, or, or to look in and to peer through. There's a natural curiosity of us human beings who are also divine to go to the places of void, to go to the empty spaces, because we're curious about what's in or through the empty space. This is what brings us to silence. This is what ultimately brings us to peace. We, we do kind of long for that emptying, that void. Because what comes then through the void and what comes out through the void is, is light and water. Remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus in the night and he said he wanted to know Nicodemus was one of the Pharisees or the Sadducees, so the, the folks that didn't want to admit that you know, Jesus had something to offer as a rabbi. And so he came to him in the night because he didn't want the others to know. <laughs> and he comes and he asks, you know, what, how, do, how do we do what you do? Like, what's the secret? And he says, you have to be born again. Nicodemus is like, what do you mean, born again? And he says, back in my mother's womb? No, 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 you're not getting it. Born again, to be born again of water and light. And what is here when we peer into these open spaces of void but water and light? And what are we but made of water, our human bodies, and form all around, and light, that divinity? So it is, you know, a kind of witnessing together of the beauty and the divinity and the wholeness of humanity when we gather around and sort of in one collective breath, tourists from all over the world, all different kinds of people walking in that realm of heaven there on Pfeiffer Beach, just a few hours from here. And of course, we don't have to go a few hours from here because we've got the 18 inches to drop from head to heart <laughs> that can bring us into realm upon realm upon realm of beauty and peace and creativity. And it's there that we sort of fortify ourselves and become then the presence of peace that is willing to be witnessed and witnesses ourselves and then witnesses the beauty and the peace and the divine flow that is all around us. Somebody said there were a thousand sandhill cranes on Staten Island in Galt, California last night. And you know, in, ja in Japan, a thousand cranes is like a, is like a completion of peace. When you've hit a thousand cranes, because cranes are a, a bird of peace, and when you've made a thousand origami cranes, like the story goes, You've, you've kind of come to the end, the fullness, the completion of peace. So there are so many ways that we might view that or see that or experience that in our world. And we might say, okay, well, this is all great. You know, you go into silence, you have prayer, you, you know, you're at a beautiful beach, you're in nature. Of course, that's going to bring wonder and awe and peace and that presence. What about in the midst, though, of war? What about in the midst of fighting? What about in the midst of otherness and divisiveness and separation. This too can be a place of peace. There was a tea master in the times of feudal Japan. He served Lord Tosa. And the tea master gave such a beautiful tea ceremony that everybody loved to be there and to watch him as he got out his clay vessel and the tea and the water and heated it over the fire. And he made beautiful tea, but it wasn't just making the tea. It was the whole experience of watching the tea being made and then sipping the tea. It was like drinking in peace. But the tea master traveled with the rest of the court when Lord Tosa and all of his entourage went to the shogun's palace. 
And when they entered, they had, all the men had to put on the robes of the samurai warrior, which is the crossed sword. And so even the tea master, who had never carried a sword and certainly never sword fought, had to put on the, the robe of the samurai warrior. And so after several days of delighting the court, the shogun court and the Lord Tosas and the lords and ladies that were all gathered there with many, many tea ceremonies, Lord Tosa finally gave leave for the tea master and said, why don't you go out and just enjoy the town and take a little time off? And so he was happy to walk about the town of Yeddo and he came across a playground where children were playing and he remembered his own son and daughter back at home and it made him smile. And so after he had a nice time, he was going across the bridge to return to the shogun's palace when a large mercenary soldier started coming toward him across the bridge the other way. The ronin was in an ugly mood and the tea master could tell. The tea master was slight of size. And as he moved toward the ronin, the ronin actually knocked him over and he fell down. And so then the ronin began to blame him for having bumped into him. And the tea master got up and he said, no, I believe actually you bumped into me and then I fell down. And so the ronin, of course, was picking a fight. And so he wanted to have a sword fight right then. But then the tea master had explained, oh no, I'm, you know, I'm wearing this because I'm serving in the shogun's palace, but I don't, you know, I don't have a sword, I don't fight, I don't, I don't know how to do that. And the ronin says, oh, right, I'm calling your bluff. I'm going to tell the whole town and you will disorn, dishonor Lord Tosa and the whole entourage and everyone. Well, at those times, the idea of dishonor was something just unspeakable, worse than death. And so... The tea master thought quickly, and he remembered that on his walk through the town of Yeddo, he had passed a sword fighting academy. And so he asked the ronin, if you give me two hours, I will come back, and I will meet you, and I will fight you with sword. And so he went to the academy, and he quickly explained his story to the sword master. And then he told the sword master that I, he wanted to learn how to hold the sword and how to, to die an honorable death. And the sword master smiled. And the tea master said, I don't see what's funny about this. <laughs> and the sword master said, I'm sorry. It's just that everybody who comes to me wants to fight and win you know, the wars against their enemies, or they want to avoid death. But you've come to me because you want to die honorably. And so he says, you know, I tell you what, before I tell you anything, why don't you show me your art? And so the tea master dropped right into that place of peace, you know, and he got out his clay vessel and his tea and his water and lit the fire and the brasier for the tea, and he did his ceremony. And after it was finished, the sword master said, when you go to meet the ronin, here's what I want you to do. Approach him as if you are providing a tea ceremony for one of your most beloved friends. And he said, and when you do, he said, Here's what I want you to do when you get to the bridge. You greet him and you thank him for waiting. You take off your jacket and your fan and place them down and roll up your sleeves and put on the headband of resolution. And you hold your sword up high and close your eyes. And then when you hear the battle cry of him coming toward you, just take both your hands and bring the sword down with all your might. And so the tea master is walking toward the site of the bridge and he's with every step feeling a little freer, letting go of more and more of his fear as he begins to think he's only performing what he loves to do, what he naturally and beautifully and skillfully does. Because you know the things we tend to love are the things we do well. And so he's just preparing himself essentially for a tea ceremony, not for his death, not for a fight. And so he gets there and there is the ronin, you know, brandishing his sword and yelling out to all the townspeople he's gathered around who are eager for the bloodbath. And so the little man, the tea master, comes along and he does exactly as he's been told. He takes off his jacket. He lays down the jacket and the fan. He rolls up his sleeves. He puts on the headband of resolution. He raises his sword and he says, I'm ready for battle now. And he closes his eyes and he waits. And he waits. The sword is light as a feather. He can't believe it. And he waits. And he waits. And he waits. 
He hears no battle cry, and so finally he opens one eye. And he's surprised to see that the ronin has laid down his own sword at his feet and has run and is hiding back behind the edge of the bridge. You see, when the ronin was in the presence of somebody completely unafraid, of somebody who was presencing completely peace, the spirit of peace, the embodiment of peace, by approaching that with what he loves, making that thing, that situation he was in, something that he loves, then peace happens, right? Then peace is, is the stillness that covers the land. So the mercenary, he couldn't have, couldn't have done it in that. In the, it, it made him, he was in a state of fear in the presence of that kind of power, that kind of peace. So the tea master went back to the sword master and he did another tea ceremony for him and he told him the story and the sword master smiled again. Because there is that kind of knowing when we meet each other in that kind of deep understanding of the spiritual journey in that place of infinite peace, there's a kind of knowing. Ah, we are witnessing one another in that divinity. We are witnessing one another in being in that presence of peace together. And so whatever it is that you do, do it naturally and do it easily and do it often and you will be practicing peace. Let it spring forth from the silence and all the more so will you be in that divine flow. Let's know this truth for ourselves. Let's be this truth in the world. Let's move through the world, popping up out of the, that little pause between inhale and exhale, which is silence, by the way, and moving into the next breath and the next movement that is naturally and skillfully what you do and love best. Let's know this together. Let's affirm this together to be in this divine flow and to witness the world in its beauty, in its honor. Together, I do what I love. I witness and share divine flow. I am the presence of peace. Mm -hmm.